Go, Christine. Okay. Well, this is great. I always feel very comfortable talking with you guys because we're all together. You know, we're all friends and have met, known each other for a really long time. So thank you um, for inviting me again to kind of go over what's going on in the legislature. And I'm here to answer questions. So if I'm veering in a direction that doesn't interest you and you want me to talk about something else that you think I might have some thoughts on or information about, I'm of course always happy to kind of take your lead in terms of what we are talking about. Um, many of you have a couple of you, I'm looking at names. A few of you have heard my briefing before, so bear with me. Um, I thought first I'd first talk a little bit about what happened during redistricting. I, I imagine many of you were following that. I know the league's keen interest in a fair redistricting process, but I thought I'd let, just let you know a little bit about what happened with um, District 43, our, our house district, and kind of a little bit on the process. So you all know, of course, that we um, did enact and we did create um, a redistricting, an independent redistricting committee, and as distinguished from a commission. It was an advisory committee to the legislature and I thought the process would work fairly well, at least from the New Mexico House perspective. I'm not gonna speak to the Senate, which I think was a little bit more, um, I don't know, not quite as smooth, let me just say. <laughs> um, I felt the commission worked well. I, you know, I think they um, were very accessible in terms of the public. And I think they were sincere in taking input on how the map should, should should go. Um, they work closely and they tried very hard to come to a conclusion with our um, Native American um, citizens. Um, they didn't get there, but we eventually did as a legislature. So um, the House enacted pretty much what was recommended by the, the committee. However, um, we had to adjust a little bit because as I said, the, the native the tribes hadn't come to kind of a consensus yet. And as a result, the committee didn't have a, a, a strong recommendation as to what to do in terms of the tribe's input. And we took the tribe's input and I, I think they felt like we listened to their interests and, and we, had, we adjusted the maps accordingly. Um, House District 43 uh, has become more compact, which, you know, in a sense is a good thing for me. Uh, if you remember 10 years ago, this area was tagged on to 43 that includes like Cuba and Guyana, that's parts of Rio Riba and in that area. And it's kind of, I have this little compact district and then there's this little arm over here. Um, and that piece has, has been taken off again. So now I don't have Cuba, I don't have Guyana. I still have some parts of Sandoval County like the Jemez area, Ponderosa uh, and so on. And I have a little bit more of Santa Fe County in La Cienega. I used to have only part of La Cienega and now I have all of La Cienega. As it turns out, uh, Los Alamos has been growing contrary to what I think maybe some people think, we have been growing and Santa Fe County was growing as, as it's probably evident to all of you. But the rural parts of the state tend to be contracting. So Susan and Etta picked up some of the district that I didn't need anymore in terms of keeping my numbers up. So Susan, um, my good friend Susan got most of what I no longer have. I have more of Santa Fe and the district is more compact. And I would say in terms of, you know, um, policy interests and so on, I think it's more, they're more, we're more cohesive in that way in terms, you know, the Santa Fe part of my district is more similar to, to Los Alamos than probably Cuba was. So that's good. The thing that I'm, you know, disappointed about, it's useful for me to have input from communities that aren't like us. And so I, I'm going to be losing a little bit of that in terms of missing Cuba and, and so on. But that's where we ended. I, I imagine most of you are aware because you keep keep yourself informed as to these kinds of things. So I felt that that was a success. The redistricting was generally a success, at least from the House perspective. And we moved on. And, you know, I'm happy with the district as as I'm working it now. Um, next thing that so that was done in a special session and then we had our usual session and our regular session and is my screen sh shared is uh -huh. it shared yeah. okay um, 
okay, I wonder why I can't see it. <laughs> details, details. It, it says I'm screen sharing, but I don't see the screen. So it let says me... legislative council service. service. Oh, okay. Now that is not what I want. I want this. Uh, I have a, you know, a, what I call a highlight sheet where I talk about what I worked on and so on. Can you see that? No. This one says, shows the seal and it says Christine Chandler State. Yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah. That's perfect. It okay. says highlights. Now let me see if I can figure out how to scroll it. And I apologize, guys. Um, we did practice, this. but it wasn't. Uh, okay, so here we are. Um, Yay, did it. Yes, and I, 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 I do this every year at the end of the session. I put together a document that helps me and the folks that I'm um, briefing, you know, remember what happened. So I felt we had a, a pretty strong, Long and successful um, session this year. It was um, a 30 day, as you all know, um, there were, you know, some order of, you know, 500 bills more or less filed in both the House and the Senate, 64 of those bills passed. Um, we are in a very strong position um, financially. Um, largely due to a, a, a great influx of money from our oil industry. Um, so in a way it's a blessing and it's a curse. We of course need to be finding ways to move away from reliance on oil, but that's a tough, that's a tough, uh, that's very hard to do. Um, that's one of the, I think, responsibilities of the tax committee, but other, other, there are other responsible committees as well. We should be looking for diversifying our economy and you know, other means to um, raise funds to replace our strong reliance on oil and gas. Um, I think right now, the price of oil's 100, I think today it was $113 a barrel. Our budget is based on, I think what we did was a $60 a barrel budget. So we have a very large um, surplus, you might call it. And some of the ways we've addressed that is through these rebates, but that's really not um, a long-term approach to addressing a problem, if you want to call it that, I guess, um, an opportunity, let's say an opportunity such as ours. Um, but we did um, use the monies that we do have in ways that I, I think most people in the state are happy with. We increased wages for state employees. We budgeted a $15 an hour minimum for state employees. We increased um, spending in higher ed. We, um, we did all of this while maintaining a 30% uh, reserve, which is remarkable. We've increased spending in public education. Um, we have been looking for ways to invest one in one term expend one time expenditures or short term expenditures like investment in infrastructure and so on, because of the concern that we know that oil it, oil revenues are very volatile. And as a consequence, we have to hedge. And that's in part why we have a 30% reserve, which is much higher than what I imagine most states have who have more stable revenue streams. I am very proud of the tax package that we have, well, actually all of the tax pass packages that we've passed in these last four years. Do I agree with all parts of them? No, but in general, I think we're moving in the right direction tax-wise in that we are finding ways to increase the progressivity of our tax system. And I expect we'll be doing more of that in the, in the next couple of years. Uh, so the tax package had multiple facets to it. There's a social security tax exemption. We exempt in some small part of military pensions. We, um, it, it, we expanded the solar market tax credit. We, the, the one item that I'm most proud of is the child income tax credit. That gives an income tax credit to everyone with children in the state. There is an income component to it in that the rebate, the tax credit is higher those with, in lower income. So it's, I guess you might call it inverse progressive or, <laughs> you know, lower income people get a higher um, tax credit and 
high income people. Um, and as I'm sure you all know, we also had a um, tax uh, a rebate program that's going to happen in July. And I'll talk a little bit about the, the rebate package that's just about to be implemented in the next few days, actually. Um, we, so this is about a $500 million package in terms of tax relief for New Mexicans. We invested in education again. I'm very pleased that we're now um, beginning to increase educator salaries to a, a level that, you know, is, is um, in line with what other states pay. Can we do more? I hope so. I think we're moving in the right direction in terms of educator salaries. We're focusing on the opportunity scholarship as well. That was an initiative that the governor and we, um, because of the revenues that we have available to us, we invested more money in the lottery scholarship, which has been a bit of a, a concern to us because the monies have been drawing down. So we reinvested in that. So it's fully funded now for at least five years. There was public safety legislation, which I'm just going to touch on lightly. Um, I was concerned during the session that we were moving away from what I view as sound policy in terms of how we um, manage the criminal justice system. There were a number of bills that were filed that were focused on kind of law and order, lock them up. Um, many of you were hearing um, probably discussions about changing the presumption so that an individual would have to prove they're not a threat as opposed to the other way around. That we were able to kill that bill uh, um, and some other, and we were able to, I guess I would say, modify other proposals that I think were more in line with sort of progressive forward thinking criminal justice um, type legislation. I know a lot of you, because I know my constituents and we talk a lot about this, we finally, finally were able to address the, the you, some people call it payday lending, some people call it small loans, but nevertheless, um, the installment loan cap, we were finally able to bring down to 36% from 175. Um, that was um, a strong initiative that my good friend Susan Herrera pushed pushed on and um, with and the speaker was very involved in trying to ensure that we were able to do that. It's amazing to me that um, of all the issues, the lobbyists come out incredibly strong on that issue. And it's it just kind of, of all the things that you would think that they would put their energies in, that was one they, they spend a lot of time working on. And it took a lot of effort, frankly, to be able to get it through the House. And the Senate was stronger than the House, truthfully. But we were able to finally get it through the House with Susan's strong push and the Speaker's support um, in terms of committee assignments and how you know, he, he chose to shepherd it through the committee process. So we were, we were fortunate in that way. And at the very end here, you'll see kind of the list of uh, bills that I sponsored or co-sponsored. As I, I think you, you all know, I'm now the chair of the tax committee, which means a lot of my bills going forward will be focused on tax legislation. And I have a responsibility in that position to, to, to shepherd that whatever tax package we put together. And um, it's been interesting um, and I'm learning a lot. The other bill that I'm very, um, I want, want to really highlight for you because I think um, the league can be helpful to me and to us, the community, the state, is um, House Joint Resolution 1, which creates uh, an exemption to the anti-donation clause so that the state can invest directly in what we're calling essential household services. So if you're a low, in, let me give you an example what I'm interested in using this for. If you're a low income person, sometimes you can't afford the hookup to your Comcast, to Comcast or CenturyLink. You know, the, the, the fiber may be in the road that's near your house, but you have to pay for the connection. And 
this bill would allow the state to create programs that would support that kind of thing, where that where we could invest directly and not run afoul of the anti-donation clause. Um, and this has come up when we were talking about how can we expand broadband. We also included other essential services such as electricity and water and sewer because we are a poor state. And as a result, there are still people who do not have um, strong ac you know, access to um, reliable wastewater services. They may have a, a septic system that's probably failing or could be failing. This will allow us to have the state to have more flexibility in, in terms of addressing the needs of citizens when it comes to essential services. So I'm very excited about that bill is a joint resolution, which means, of course, it will be on the ballot this coming cycle in November. And whatever we can do to get the word out in support of that um, constitutional amendment would be um, much appreciated. So with that, I'm gonna stop my share. So I can look at you, it's really hard when I can't see people's faces. And um, just talk a little bit about the last special session, which occurred in April. Um, we did two things. Uh, we um, renegotiated our relationship with the governor <laughs> in a sense. You'll remember there was a big flap. Um, there was something of a flap. The governor um, vetoed our junior bill. And junior bills, when I first came to the legislature, I was like, what the heck? What the heck is this junior bill thing? You know, I was like, I could, it's really a supplemental budget. So, you know, House Bill 2 is our budget bill. You all know that, of course. And after the budget bill is enacted, um, we often have revenues that are still available to us for whatever reason, because the budget is, draft, you know, created in December and January. And so then there's, then we do some kind of, you know, additional spending if we have uh, sufficient monies. And so the junior bill was, passed. we had a junior, we had enough money as is evident by the huge increase in revenues that we have. And we were able to, to um, enact a supplemental budget. And I know you all know this, that the legislators, individual le legislators can earmark. It's really, in a sense, um, a part of the junior bill is an earmark bill. I mean, we we are allowed to earmark. Um, this, the revised bill requires that those earmarks be published. Um, most of us were publishing them anyway, we, but nonetheless, that's fine. Every Most of us, I can't say all of my colleagues believe we should be transparent with this stuff, but I would say a large majority of us agree we should be transparent with all this stuff. So we had a junior bill. We resolved our differences with the governor. We did some cleanup so that on some of the items she felt weren't clear or not appropriate and so on. But essentially it's it stayed intact as was, as it was originally with some cleanup. And we also passed another rebate package. So this year we're gonna get three rebates. Um, one is about to be deposited in your bank accounts right now as we speak. It will be um, 500, let me think about this. How is this gonna go? It's gonna, let's see, if you're single, you'll be getting 250 now. If you're married filing jointly, you'll get 500 this month. And it is gonna be about the, around now. I spoke to the tax secretary a couple of days ago and the, the, the payments are eminent. So you might wanna check your bank accounts if you do direct deposit. Then there is a rebate that will be coming out in July. That rebate is income. Um, tested. And it, so if you earn less than 75,000, if you're si single filer, um, joint filers, 150,000, you will be getting um, a rebate of either $250 or $500 if you're a joint filer. And then again, in August, <laughs> we, you will be getting the second part of the um, rebate that's coming out in May. And that again is um, $500, but like 250 Gosh, let's see. I'm I'm trying to think this through. It will be 250 and then 500. Sorry, um, I'm getting very confused with all the numbers we've been throwing around in terms of rebates. But that's where we're at. Um, do I think rebates is a policy? No, we should not be moving in the direction of rebates as a policy for the state. But this was a quick um, way to address 
some of the budget surplus that we now have to think about in terms of investing into and how we how we deal with it. And it seems like a funny thing to be saying, but you know, it is a little bit of a a difficult thing to to address and manage. Uh, we have a lot of money coming in. We know not all of it is going is recurring, so we're reluctant to invest too heavily in recurring, at least I, let me put it this way. Some of us, meaning me and my, some of my colleagues are reluctant to put invest too much of it in recurring expenses. And some of us, and that's meaning me and some of my colleagues are reluctant to look too, um, too much, God, I have a, a drill going on too much at um, tax relief. There is going to be a push, I believe, and some from some of my colleagues for discussions of lowering things like the income tax um, and other tax relief mechanisms. And the reason I'm reluctant is because we know the oil and gas industry is, a, is not gonna last, that boom is not gonna last forever. And then we'll be in a position of having lower taxes and putting the next you know, group of legislators in four years or five years from now to have to raise taxes. And I can tell you right now, it is not easy to raise taxes once they've been lowered. We're still suffering from tax cuts that Bill Richardson pushed through in 20, what is it, 2004, 2005. So, um, I, I'm, you know, some of us are going to be working over the summer, and hopefully, we'll have some thoughts on how to address diversifying our revenue streams. This tax conference I came to had some ideas, and and we'll be pursuing that. But it's a tricky situation, as you can see where we're at, and I, I don't know how we're going to, what the bottom line is going to be when we finally, you know, come to conclusion with this. But it's. It sounds like a funny problem to have to have almost like too much money, but it, it really is a difficult problem at this point. Um, so with that, I would love to hear from you guys and have a conversation. And I saw a note, I think from Lynn um, saying, why not put it in infrastructure? We are, <laughs> but you can only spend so much on infrastructure at one time. Um, Every state in the country has ARPA money and other kinds of funds coming in from the feds. Every, a lot of states also have budget surpluses for a variety of reasons. And as a result, they're all investing in infrastructure, which is a very good thing to do, of course, but you need contractors that you can hire to do the work um, to support infrastructure. And they're all being hired across the country. So, um, Yes, we are going to, you know, invest in infrastructure, but it's even spending on infrastructure is tricky in terms of our ability to do so in a prompt way. And um, Nancy wanted to know how many voters are in our district and what's the average size of a district? Oh, OK. So my district is about twenty nine thousand five hundred and that with some change, you know, it's sort of in that ne neck of the woods. Um, the average size now is about 30,000, 31,000. So um, mine is on the smaller side, but I fall within the, the plus or minus 10% parameter that's been set in terms of what is considered, you know, a, a, you know, appropriate size for all the districts. I have a question. So all this sure. money that we have and all this mm -hmm. unemployment that we have, is it possible, and mind you, I have I do not know the answer to this question. That's why yeah. I'm asking. It. Um, so all these people who are unemployed or underemployed or whatever word you want to use, how is it possible to get them or to a job opportunities place where they will train people how to do this infrastructure stuff and you know all these oh. things that we need jobs for, but no one we can't find anybody. I mean, you can't even find anybody to do anything, period, right now. But, you know, I mean, like, they don't know how, and I don't think they know that they that they could possibly learn how to do that. And, and I know that some of the, uh, the community colleges are doing that with high school kids, but I'm really thinking not only that, that's still good, but there are people 
who are unemployed and there's thousands of jobs out there and I'm having a disconnect as to. Well, um, so I, I think there are two kind of concepts in your question, Carol Ann. So let's talk of one is we as a state, and I think this is true also of many states, um, do not have a train, a, a train sufficiently trained workforce to attract business to the state. Um, and we've known that for a long time, I think. And there has been a push, certainly in this administration and with this, you know, the legislature in the last five years or so towards job training programs. And we have been working with the labor unions actually, who have really stepped up to help us bring in electricians and machinists, and they have been collaborating with, um, first of all, high schools. I know that the union has come to our high school, you know, some of the unions uh, leaders have come to our high school to talk to kids about the value of the trades and what opportunities there are in, in terms of uh, learning a trade. And certainly the community colleges and like Northern New Mexico College, University, and our local campus, um, you know, there has been a strong push on so many levels in terms of tech, um, solar technicians. There's a program at Santa Fe Community College. There is a push in that direction. So that's one point, and you're, and I think we're making progress there. The second point is why are employers having trouble hiring? That's not an unemployment problem. That's a hiring, I don't know, lack of workforce problem that almost nobody knows the answer to. I, you know, you listen to the various reasons why. One has to do with the fact that people um, re re started to reevaluate their lives during the pandemic, and as a result are valuing different things in different ways. Um, the other has to do with the fact we need to get um, our, our child care programs up and running in a, in a way that's more user-friendly for people who want to go back to work, but um, need to be able to find support for in terms of childcare. That's, that's a reality. And we need to do better with that. I know that the governor has been investing in programs along those lines, recognizing that. So there are two issues. We are making progress, I believe, on job training. And I think there are programs in place that try to get people back to work. What we I ha, we had a briefing at one of my committee hearings, and they all kind of blur together about what we've been doing in the state. We're doing okay in the state in terms of rehiring professionals. It, and first of all, professionals weren't as impacted by the pandemic because many of them could work from home. So we're our jobs have rebounded in terms of those kinds of activities. Where we're having problems is in the hospitality and tourism. Um, jobs. And that, those are waiters and waitresses and so on and so forth. And I personally feel that employers just need to make their jobs more attractive to people. Um, and the, the kind of pushback I got from the, the restaurant industry when we were pursuing the paid, the paid sick leave bill, it was incredible. I, um, Little did I know when I co-sponsored that bill with my colleague Angelica Rubio that it would be so at sometimes almost vicious in terms of the amount of opposition and the kind of negative, strong negative energy. And now they're realizing, one, if they don't offer sick leave, people aren't going to come back to work. And two, if they don't offer competitive wages, people aren't going to. They're now having, I would, you know, I, sh I guess I shouldn't say I was laughing, but I was sort of, I was like, they're paying $15 an hour now. And, and they would come to hearings when we would talk about minimum wage increase, which is something we did accomplish in these last four years or so. Remember, we increased the state's minimum wage. It's, it's like the world was going to come to an end. And there would be no way they could ever survive. And here we are, they're doing it voluntarily, $15 an hour. You know, so um, I just feel that American businesses, unlike European businesses and many other countries that are similar to us in terms of our, you know, quality of life, level of industry and so on, 
has a very narrow view about their relationship to their workers. And instead of viewing the, it as a kind of a team effort, I actually heard a legislator referred to a worker as um, like an, an input, you know, like kind of like buying paper towels or something, you know, it's just another input into their, you know, their business. And I, I, I remember thinking, I've got to find that on tape the next time that person runs, because it was really a kind of a dehumanizing way to talk about people who are really part of your business. So on the one hand, businesses would come and say, oh, these folks are part of our family and we've known them forever. And then I'd say, well, great, pay them $15 an hour. They're part of your family. And that was like, oh my God, the world is gonna come to an end. But um, it, it, the pandemic, and I know in a way I'm speaking in a cliche because I know we, we've all heard this in the news and so on. It has caused people to rethink and it is juggering our economy in a way that may in the end be beneficial. It, it feels kind of strange right now. And I have to say, I do, I, a lot of us are probably very uneasy about you know, the shortages and it leaves us with this very unsettled feeling, but it may be an opportunity for us to rethink how we do business and how employers and businesses interact. And I'd like to think that's gonna be an ultimately a positive thing. Sorry if I'm so long-winded. And I see there are some questions. Um, okay. I, yeah, I you... have a couple of questions. Sure. Oh, hi, Nancy. Hi. hi. Uh, thank you for answering about the number of voters you have. Um, one has to do with the gross receipts tax, and the other has to do with the higher ed scholarships. Mm -hmm. the, the, as of uh, the 1st of July, the gross receipts now is applied to where uh, a product is sold, not where, I mean, where it's delivered. It's called uh, destination that, sourcing. That creates tremendous bookkeeping problems. As a publisher of books and a seller of books online and from, the, from your trunk when you run into somebody who wants to buy a book, the, cookbooks that we've sold, it's just a, why, do you have a, an answer for why that was changed? Uh, uh, absolutely. Um, because if we want to benefit from internet sales, which we um, did want to benefit from, like for example, Amazon, um, and we wanted uh, the area where the item is sold to receive the benefit of that particular GRT, like Los Alamos County residents are avid users of Amazon and Barnes and Noble and all of those other mail order places. We were losing a lot of revenues in, in terms of um, the change in the way people do business. There are very, we're not doing brick and mortar anymore we're doing a lot of online and we have to track it by where it's delivered. That's could why you, it was changed. Could you exempt a New, New Mexico purchaser in the state? Because like Santa Fe has what, eight or nine different uh, areas for the gross receipts tax that change. So we sell a book we, to someone in Santa Fe, we have to be sure we have their zip code and then they have one um, gross receipts rate and somebody else with a different address in Santa Fe, that's a different one. I'm just, it's a bookkeeping nightmare. So um, maybe I'll talk to you about this later. Well, actually the tax department is working on, um, on software. And in fact, it should have been implemented by now that you just plug in the, the zip code and it will tell you what the GRT is. Um, and actually there's the city of Santa Fe and then there's, the county, all counties have the same tax rate. If you're in Los Alamos County, it doesn't matter where you live. It's going to be the Los Alamos County tax rate. It doesn't matter. That's correct. It's, but there are other other entities where it is a problem. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. The other, yeah, sure. the other question I have is before when you spoke to the MOW uh, group, you said that the scholarship, the free scholarship to go back to UNM and other high institutions uh, was for not only undergrads, but also graduates. But I yeah. think 
I think you mentioned today this were un for undergrads. Uh, well, Nancy, Myra, I don't believe I said it was for graduates. You mean like master's degrees? And yeah, that? like master's degree oh. or yeah, or, or is it a stop at the end of the four year um, it, I, undergraduate? I believe, and I'm sorry if I said that at, at the that. You know, the military order of foreign wars. Or I can't remember right. the exact. Yeah. Well, MOW, I, I, I don't remember saying that. What I said was it's for four year associates and like certificates. And so it would include things like trade programs and that kind of thing. Yeah. And, um, and um, it didn't matter how long you were away from school. So for example, the lottery scholarship has these parameters that you have to fulfill. So if you were, um, you know, you wanted to work for five years or whatever, or you you were raising your family and you didn't complete your college degree or your associate's degree, you can still qualify, unlike the lottery scholarship, which requires pretty prompt enrollment into the school. So if I misspoke, I, I apologize, Nancy, but it is for, it's not just for four years degree, which is what I was trying to emphasize there. It's for people who are getting associate's degrees and um, job training certificates and so on and so forth. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Sure. So I won't go back and get my PhD then. <laughs> <laughs> go for it, Nancy. Thank you so much. Yeah, go for it anyway, Nancy. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I just want to thank you so much uh, for such a wonderful presentation and uh, for doing what you were doing for on behalf of our town. Uh, I know it's a lot of hard work and they're committed and I hope you get reelected. Thank, thank you. Well, I'm unopposed, so I'm going to have to really miss oh, if well. I don't get reelected this round. I didn't realize that. <laughs> no flaming uh, affairs, Christine. Okay. So let me read. Uh, Kyle had this question. I'm, I'm going to read it off the chat. Are people talking about the gas tax? I am opposed to lowering it for lots of reasons, but I can understand the pressure on elected officials to do it. Uh, um, Actually, no, we're not talking about lowering the gas tax. What we did was instead of that, we did these rebates. So the gas prices were increasing um, significantly even in April and they're even getting worse actually. But um, we looked at lower, the gas tax is 70, 17 cents a gallon, okay? If we, let's say suspended that, which was something people were talking about initially, the amount of money people would save, we did the calculation, is not that much. Our rebates, the rebates we're putting out are, 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 is a larger amount than what people would save if we just suspended the gas tax. The other thing is parts of the gas tax are pledged like to support bonds and so on and so forth. There are increments of the gas tax that are I guess you could say earmarked or whatever, and that would have created a huge complication for us. So highly unlikely we'll be going after suspending the gas tax or lowering the gas tax or anything like that. And I'm, I think Barbara's got her hand up. I don't know. Okay, you want to go, Barbara? And then I'll just and then actually Jesse, where is, is Jesse still here? Somewhere. I just thought is Jesse here. So okay. Chris, I'd like to know. Will support the joint resolution for an independent redistricting commission when it comes to the legislature again. Maybe we'll see what it looks like, Barbara. <laughs> well, I'm really, we, go ahead. So there was one during this last session. Did I, I know that they're still tinkering with it, but if you'd let us know what your requirements are, that would okay. Be Thanks. Sure. Jesse, do you want to just say yours? Because uh, it's it sort of oh, has yeah. My yeah. I guess it was oh, just sorry. sort of comments like uh, people want more than seven dollars an hour to live on, miss so minimum wage, and you talked about that that people are now doing it themselves, which I think is a good thing. Uh, many of the benefits in jobs. Now I'm a nurse, so. Uh, I've had fairly good benefits, but other uh, workers don't. Parents should be off with their newborn. Yep. You know, whatever, you know, that is something that would ease up problems in 20 years if you're nurturing and nursing your baby. 
I, I agree 100% paid family and medical leave. I have, that was one of the first big bills I sponsored a few years ago. And we continue to work on that and it will be filed again uh, this year. And I have some great co-sponsors. Linda Serrato has signed on to the bill and um, Patricia Roybal Caballero has been one of my co-sponsors on that bill. And it, it, it addresses your point directly. It would allow parents with newborns to get time off. Um, it create, it, it's, I'm not sure how much detail you wanna know, but it creates kind of a trust fund so what it, it's sort of like unemployment tax, we would, there would be a small fee on the employer, a small fee on the employee, it goes into a trust fund, and people who are eligible, and the eligibilities are quite broad, you know, certainly people with newborns and adoptive children, uh, needing to care for a close relative, a parent, a spouse, children, you know, those kinds of things. And if you qualified, you would apply to the state, uh, the employer would have to give you the time off and you would be, you would get up to two thirds of your salary, you know, it's sort of like a disability program in a way. Some states have disability programs that are like this. So you get two thirds of your salary up to, I think, $60,000, you know, for that period of time that you were away. So, and it's up to 12 weeks. Um, and that's, that's the kind of the, overarching framework for that program. We will be filing that bill again. So keep an eye on it. You guys want to lobby for it? Go for it. Because it's, oh, right. it's a great bill. And um, I believe it's going to happen one of these days. And we just need to keep, you know how many of you follow the legislature. Sometimes it takes a few sessions to get it through. And it is controversial. The business community doesn't like it. Um, so we're, it's gonna be one of those fights, but it, we will continue to bring that bill and fight for it until we achieve um, you know, that for the state. I, and I think it will make it a very desirable place for employers to come because they won't be paid. You know, there's a small fee, you know, you're spreading out the cost of the program amongst everyone, which will lower the cost for you know, employers who wanna offer a program like this. And so I would think some of these things make it a desirable place for us. Uh, we know that parents need to bond with their children and that creates a healthier child, you know, as they progress in life. And that will cause us, I hope, to lower our, you know, our substance abuse problems, our, um, our mental health problems that we have in the state. And that's a good thing. Yes. People who are stressing about what's happening with their husband, because he's getting his chemo today and I can't be there because I have to do thus and such, you know, I have to be at work. All it, it, they have found that employees are more productive when they're, yes. they're not, they're not distracted. And they, you know, with the stress of having to deal with the juggling of all these obligations. So, you know, I think it's a good program and we'll be pursuing it more. Well, I so agree with you and I really thank you for pushing this through. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Nice to meet you. So I'm going to give you this challenging one because of course it's from Eduardo. Um, oh. <laughs> he says, thank you for taking this time, Chris. Uh, you can probably predict my question, which is, what are your current thoughts on ranked choice voting? Oh, and yeah. On open <laughs> choice? He warned you. I'm just going to yeah, say. Yeah, I know. I know. 1249. Um, so, yeah. I, I am very nervous. I'm sorry. I'll be straight with you guys because I know you also, well, at least the league supports ranked choice. I'm, it worries me because um, I feel that there's an attack on our voting system right now where people are, have, are losing confidence or the powers that be or the forces of evil out there are attacking it in such a way that people don't have confidence in the outcomes. So one of my concerns with ranked choice voting is it's even more, it's more complicated in terms of explaining to people how the system works. And it, I think it has the potential for undermining confidence in the outcomes. Sorry guys, I know you don't agree with me, but um, I'm being straight with you. Um, I think it's going to be hard to get through the House and Senate. Um, 
because of these kinds of issues. Can I just break in to say sure. that? <clears throat> so the the state board had had added rank choice voting to our position on elections, and at the convention it was uh, we lo it was removed. Really, for the yeah. same reason that I articulated. I think so. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people know who's. I like things like runoffs. You know, same day runoff or even a week later kind of. I do think it's good to have that someone should be required to have more than fifty percent of the vote to win an election, and so things like runoffs and that those sorts of mechanisms. I think, I you know, I think it's a good approach as well. But I I just worry that it's just that people won't have confidence in the outcome. And I'm really worried about where we're going as a country, just generally, um, you know, in terms of confidence in our elections. And it's really depressing, um, some of the stuff that's going on election-wise and other things, really. So regarding voting, um, I don't remember the guy from Farmington. Um, I don't remember who um, kind of squashed and did the, the filibuster thing on, on voting. Oh yeah, that's Senator Cher. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> say his name, I remember. But you know, I think it's um, it's kind of interesting, and I've not talked to Maggie, but no one seems to be worried about states who have all mail-in ballots, um, and yet they're worried about a few mail-in ballots. And I did mail mine in, by the way, but um, or I put it in the Dropbox. I don't know if that's called mail-in. Anyway, um, I don't know what we need to do to make things easier. Um, and I will say that one of our members, um, you know, she's 89 and I guess you probably won't be any younger in, in like November and mm -hmm. she'll be walking any better uh, or driving. Yeah. So I just took her absentee ballot, the, the paper ones, um, because she didn't have a computer. And, um, and she told me, I just said, you know what? Fill out both of these. And I took them in. Um, I had them, well, I had Andrea take them into the clerk and just say, well, now you have one for now and one for uh, the next election in November. Um, and I'm thinking, like, what is the problem with this that we have to keep doing that for people? I don't know. It's just, it's. Well, um, you know, I'm sure that there'll be proposals to try to increase access, which, you know, of course, I completely support. Uh, um, and I've been very pleased, you know, Maggie, our Secretary of State does her best in terms of it. And we should, we have really a lot to be proud of, frankly, in terms of trying to increase access, drop boxes, you know, it, it, you know, our, uh, you know, our absentee voting process, or, you know, um, I, I just, I think we do have a lot to be proud of. I'm sure there's ways to improve. And of, of course, you know, to the extent I can help in that regard, I will do so. It's really super important. Thank you. I'm gonna read this, probably this last one because Chris has to leave in two minutes. So this is from Jody. Then, and I don't think this maybe sounds right, Jody, but you can correct me. I'm reading what you wrote. The nursing home situation dire, especially with hiring hmm. their own permanent staff. Nursing homes are paying $110 an hour for agency nurses because they oh, can't get yeah. employees, even though at least in Brio, um, offers training, health insurance, vacation, and sick leave. Nursing homes can't rate increase their way out of this. Despite the NM healthcare surcharge, an act that goes to better wages, we can't pay enough. The bed tax is supposed to be helping us cover expenses, but prices are going to going up way higher than this very liberal increase. Two questions. One, is there anything the state can do to control prices of contract agency staffing? Mm -hmm. And two, because there's no limit to lawsuit awards, is there any way to limit the current huge settlements against nursing homes? Okay. And you have um, one minute. Thank, well, I'll try to, t I may take two minutes. Um, so, um, you know, that's a really good question. You know, thank you for bringing the, uh, the thing about those, you know, those contract service, that is an issue. And I, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but I will look into it, Jody. And thanks for bringing that to my attention. Um, on the um, malpractice issue, um, glad you brought that up because I've been hearing about it. Um, 
first of all, so there is, um, the nursing homes are not part of our patient compensation fund. And I know that there has been an interest in joining the fund. Um, and, and I'm sorry if I'm getting into the hyper-technical. The fund, if you're a member of the fund, there are caps on the limits of, there, there's a cap on the liability that can be um, levied, I guess you'd say, against the provider. Um, there has been discussion about adding um, nursing homes. There has been a reluctance in part because the fund is underfunded and nursing homes could easily aggravate that um, situation. So it's a difficult problem and I'd be happy to work with the industry, but I will say this too, Jody. Although we have a good system here, Sombrio and Aspen Ridge are high quality providers, I think. People get abused in nursing homes, <laughs> they do. And I think the industry has to come to terms with that and also police themselves and provide mechanisms for dealing with nursing homes that hurt people because they do. And we've all heard horror stories about people who have been left unattended for hours, who haven't been bathed, who have who receive poor treatment, who have been abused, and to to place all of it on the state or trial lawyers or litigators, I think is unfair. And we can talk some more about it. But I want people to be aware that there's a reason why some of those judgments are issued, and it's because someone was really hurt badly, like our grandmother, and. They, the, that is not a good thing. I, I think we all know that. And there has to be a deterrent for that kind of behavior. And at the moment, the deterrent is, has, is litigation and high judgments. There are nursing homes in the state who, who do a horrible job and have found to have abused patients and none of us want that. So I, I'm happy to talk with you more offline, but the industry needs to be part of this and a discussion about how they're gonna regulate themselves. Because right now the way they're being regulated is through litigation. And that is not an ideal uh, approach to this kind of activity. Sorry, Jody, you, 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 you're on a board of a nice group with a nice group of people, but there are bad actors in the nursing home industry. Uh, Jesse. Raise your hand. I don't see where you are. Yeah. But okay. Oh, yeah. I would just like to talk with Christine at, uh, offline. I just finished teaching two and a half years, well, three years CNA class. These students went to nursing homes. Mm -hmm. I actually worked in a nursing home, the one of the best in Santa Fe for six months. That was all I could take. Mm. So I would, there are a lot of things that I would like to address to someone and maybe you're the person. Because yeah, I'd love to hear, I'd love to talk with you. I really would, because I hear about this and of course we need nursing homes, we need assisted living homes, but they have to be high quality because there are a lot of vulnerable people in those institutions and we have to protect them. You know, I worry a lot about, and any one of us could be in those places. That's why we all care about it. You know, I could end up there and God only knows what could happen to me. <laughs> well, pray you don't is yeah. all I can say. Pray that you don't. And mm -hmm. the price does not necessarily mean it's high quality. Right. So I so, just want I look forward to talking with you about this. Thank you. And my email, please go to my legislative email because I really would like to talk to you. And so maybe we can set something up when um, we have time. So I do have to leave. I'm going to be catching a plane. I have to check out and they're going to find me if I don't. But yeah, always yeah. love seeing you guys. So um, hang in there. Hope, hope to see you again. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Chris. Thank you.